North America, and the U.S. in particular, is the world's hotspot of salamander diversity, hosting about a third of all species. Researchers think that about half of U.S. species may be susceptible to the deadly fungus called B. sal, and scientists believe it is only a matter of time before it gets to North America. When it does, they warn it could mean devastation and maybe extinction for a massive amount of amphibians. In an effort to head off the threat, Scientists have created the B-Cell Task Force in 2015. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explores, a special podcast series about some of the most recent reporting from MangaBay.com's global team. Join me for a deeper discussion on one such project, where I'll explore issues with experts on the front lines of the looming salamander pandemic to find out what we know now and what is being done to keep North America's and the world's salamanders safe. I sat down with Dr. Jake Kirby, who is the former chair of this task force. In this conversation, he explains what the B-Sal task force is, how it came to be, and what it is currently working on. He goes into detail about the working relationships the task force has with federal entities of Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and how they are all working together to manage and mitigate the potential damage of this pandemic. Most importantly, He also describes what we as citizens can do to help. This was an illuminating conversation to say the least, and there are many lessons to be drawn from what the scientific community has done in preparation to fight this pandemic. So the B-Cell Task Force is sort of a conglomerate of scientists, folks that work with federal agencies, folks from all over, like associated with the pet trade, anyone that's sort of concerned with salamander health really is, is the core of this. We're formerly the North American b Task Force. And so we uh, have representatives from Mexico and from Canada as well. The b is a pathogen. It's short for Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans, which is a long name. So we call it b for short. And so this task force was basically formed to try and deal with not only the science of how this pathogen works, but more importantly, with ways to direct policy. And the basic idea is to prevent, or at least delay as long as possible, the introduction of this pathogen into North America. And so can you clarify for me, do you work directly with the U.S. government, the Canadian government, and the Mexican government? Yeah, we have kind of formal relationships with certain entities in the and federal agencies and then informal ones and other ones. So for instance, we have from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, people that work for the Fish and Wildlife Service that are involved at high levels of this committee and are able to provide feedback. We also have representatives from the Canadian equivalent of the Fish and Wildlife Service that are working with us and also even actually providing funding to run some of the things that we need to do. Down in Mexico, it's a little less formal. We just have sort of scientists that work there that have some sort of connection, but not really a formal role in the government. It's sort of a group that we're trying to build year after year and get more people involved. And I think in particular, we've had some great success uh, with the pet trade most recently. When we think of pandemics, it's impossible not to compare what's happening with our current crisis and the novel coronavirus and think of a pandemic facing amphibians in somewhat different terms. Dr. Kirby phrased this in a very human way, which painted a very sobering picture of the potential danger this pathogen could have, not just on salamanders, but on amphibians everywhere. Of course, with the sort of COVID-19 pandemic that's happening and affecting everyone, it becomes pretty clear how critical that is when you have this pandemic. I think what's important to note is something like B-cell, well, something like the coronavirus is really only affecting humans. That's one species. B-cell is, is threatening thousands of amphibian species. I think rather than just thinking of how horrifying it is if, you know, 100 people die, it, it's more horrifying when you think about 100 populations dying. And it's even more horrifying when you think about 100 species dying and being completely extinct. That's really what freaks us out. Amphibians are going to die from disease and there's going to be some sort of natural course to it. But because of, I think, a lot of human intervention and spread, it happens a lot more quickly. And we've seen massive extinctions happening in amphibians and disease is a big player in that. So that is really, I think, the important uh, message for folks to understand. Um, This isn't just another amphibian disease. This isn't just another sick amphibian. This is a massive pandemic that's affecting hundreds of species. And that's really why we, you know, are sort of giving up a lot of our time and energy and effort to try and protect these species here in North America, but across the world, really. Of course, B-cell is not the first pathogen to make its way to North America. And as Dr. Kirby will note, 
certain federal agencies were taking stock of the lessons learned from previous animal pandemics. However, he says Dr. Karen Lips at the University of Maryland, who previously had experience working with another deadly outbreak, was instrumental in making sure that B cell was given the attention it needed. She was involved with a previous pathogen, BD, we call it, <laughs> same genus, but a different species that has had massive effects on amphibians across the world. And so she sort of saw this new pathogen and saw the danger of it and didn't want it to happen again. And so she's at University of Maryland and has contacts in D.C. And I think a lot of her efforts went pretty far in sort of getting a lot of this sort of the national recognition that it needed. And so with the help of people like Dr. Lips, federal agencies and academics alike were united in their concern about a major pandemic happening. I think we have historical pandemics in place through things like white nose syndrome, which is in bats. So this is another fungal pathogen, but this is sort of wiping out bat populations. And so there is sort of a precedent in terms of wildlife disease there. The federal government was sort of seeing, particularly the Fish and Wildlife Service, of trying to play catch up. So trying to find ways to curb the spread and deal with massive outbreaks. As academics were sort of discovering this pathogen occurring in different countries in Europe in particular, the concern spread pretty quick among academia. So that concern, I think, was voiced pretty quickly to different agencies in the federal government. It worked pretty effectively in terms of we sort of put in a policy having to do with the Lacey Act, which modified some important policy to reduce trade of salamanders in the country. So there it's something that, you know, I think is seen. There was also some money put forth in some amphibian monitoring programs within the, the U.S. Geological Service to, to start scanning and surveying for that. Yeah, so there are gatherings, of course, of a lot of officials, both with the federal wildlife agencies and the state wildlife agencies. And so there's a lot of discussion that goes on between those folks that run those different groups. And they are always in contact with academics and diagnosticians and CDC, all sorts of people involved in different aspects of disease and disease spread. So yeah, so I think they didn't know about it. We told them about it. They became very concerned about it. And we've been trying to sort of move forward with policies that are effective and useful. And so... The National B-Cell Task Force was created. There was sort of a meeting that happened several years ago, and a lot of the uh, researchers and agency folks that were involved decided it was, it was time to form a partnership and try to get some effective uh, things done. And those decisions and tasks make up the workday of eight different working groups within the B-Cell Task Force. By accident, I referred to these working groups as battalions, which Dr. Kirby noted was actually appropriate since, in essence, we are waging war on b -cell. Can you tell me now, we're going to switch into what the task force is made up of and how it functions, but can you tell us what these battalions in the task force are and what each are responsible for? So I like your uh, use of the word battalion. That's a good night. That's a good term. We call them working groups, but we, we, we can use the battalion term because it is sort of a fight that we're uh, undergoing. Yeah, so we basically have about seven or eight different working groups, and these are split in their tasks, so they're sort of focus. So they're sort of obvious ones that are in place, like research, which is a pretty heavily used group, and that's mostly academics that are doing the frontline you know, research and trying to understand things about the disease, the pathology of it, the transmission of it, those kinds of ideas. But then we also have other kind of important groups as well. So a primary one that was formed early on was a response working group. And that worked closely with Fish and Wildlife Service and mostly with the state, the different state wildlife services. And basically the idea there was we created a template policy that we could give to each of the state agencies so that they would have a response plan. So when a positive was detected in their state, they could know exactly what to do to determine if it was an actual positive and steps to take within their state and how to report it and all these sorts of things. So early on, you know, we worked on validating some of these diagnostics as well. So that's another kind of working group. So a team of just expert folks that, that do testing, finding out what tests were right. And then as we got those tests out, if you determined that, you know, you had an actual positive in your state, what to do. That's sort of the, you know, a lot of it is just actual nuts and bolts uh, stuff. We also have other things like a, a decision support team, which is more of a modeling framework. And that becomes, so to me as a professor of biology, I, I'm not really involved, you know, in the, in the nuts and bolts of these policy making <laughs> decisions. But it turns out for if you're managing, you know, a, a wildlife refuge or a state park or something like that, like you have to defend that you're putting resources in X and so on and so forth. And so some of that effort has been 
just simply creating models where people can sort of defend their actions. So if we protect these amount of species now, it will save us this many dollars later on. It's pretty cool, I think, actually. It's a very multifaceted group. It's not really simply just focused on, here's the research, go do it. We have lots of experts with lots of real expertise that are investing in this. And and I'll even say personally, in terms of my role in the group, you know, I started out in this diagnostics group because I, you know, run a lot of samples for different amphibian pathogens. But as I sort of taken on more of a leadership role in the group, I actually learned a ton. So it's been really helpful for me just to understand how this all works. Like in previous discussions I've had on this podcast with people like Daniel Greer of the USGS, I wanted to further clarify what actually happens when an affected salamander is found. What occurs within this task force after one is discovered? Yeah, so that, that's a big thing. It depends on who finds it, right? So, so we also have a communication working group because in general, who's going to find these infected salamanders are the general public when they're on a hike, right? And they may not know anything about it. So yeah, so thank you for doing this podcast because I think a really important aspect we still need to work on better is just getting this in the sort of, you know, national consciousness so that when you see a sex salamander, you're concerned, right? Um, but but generally speaking, when people do find like loads of, of dead amphibians, they'll report it to whatever land that's on. So if it's on a state park or on a, you know, a city park or something like that, generally concerned citizens will report that to the proper officials. And that's when we can really kick in. The main thing they do, I think, is really just give a chain of reporting. And so that's been effective so far, actually, where I'll be on a chain of emails because someone will discover a sick salamander. And so we can have kind of top people respond very quickly, get tissue from that animal, test it and see if it actually has a positive for this particular pathogen, or even get it to expert vets to determine, is it something else that's killing them? Because an important part of this is this is one pathogen, but there are many and there are likely to be many more. Another sort of advantage of this group is that we sort of have this team of experts form that can respond very quickly. The chain of emails is such a crucial aspect that the Department of Defense, which owns a significant amount of U.S. land, set up its own email-based alert system just for this purpose. In these different agencies that, you know, they all sort of have their own policies of alerting and doing things. So that's the idea of that response working group is to allow the different systems to report differently. So Department of Defense does have a, a you know, lot of land, um, you know, Air Force bases and other types of military bases. Uh, and they also have a lot of open space on those lands. So they have people that are concerned with the wildlife on those lands. And they can be nice reserves, actually, for a lot of lands. So in those cases, yeah, we can definitely get reports in from folks. And then I also know that there's a lot of work going on. They have their own sort of granting program to do work on those lands. And so we have lots of academics actually doing the work on those lands to sort of understand, you know, the risk of spread and how that might happen. So what are people looking for when they're keeping an eye out for a potential carrier? What does an affected salamander look like exactly? Chytridiomycosis is the name of uh, the disease. It has a lot of sort of general things, but a big thing we see is kind of the sloughing off of their skin. So salamanders will normally shed skin, you know, on a regular basis. But because this is a skin infection, they sort of have this this immune response, if you will, to try and slough off as much skin as possible and the, and the idea that it can slough off some of these, you know, infective zoospores. So generally, you'll see animals that have a lot of inflammation, so red or swollen, but often are sloughing a lot of skin uh, as well. Oftentimes, though, typically what people find are just dead frogs or dead salamanders in this case. So So at this point, I had to wonder, a civilian can report to a state park or governing entity of the land they find the salamander on. What would be the protocol following this, specifically for a park ranger or employee? What happens to the salamander and how do they treat the situation? Yeah, I mean, generally, if you find a dead animal, then, then basically the idea is to get Uh, that dead animal to a testing center. We basically want to keep some sterility. If you have several dead animals, which is often the the case, you know, in these things, they sort of spread like an epidemic and and kind of wipe out things. To wear gloves so that you're not spreading, you know, the pathogen around, to contain it in a Ziploc bag or something safe, to keep them cold. And then they generally get shipped off to some sort of diagnostic testing center from there. While we wait for those test results, depending on their capabilities, we recommend that they sort of quarantine that particular area. So if it's an area where the general public can go a lot and and will go frequently, that basically they can issue some warnings to, you know, stay off that trail or whatever it might be until we can sort 
to get a yes or no answer. We haven't had a yes yet. So what happens after that, we have kind of ideas for, but, but luckily we haven't had to deal with that quite yet. As Dr. Kirby mentioned, no salamanders out of more than 10,000 that have been tested have ever tested positive for the fungus. So what would the task force do if a test comes back positive? Not surprisingly, quarantining was the primary response, but also preventing people from interacting with or intentionally or passively transporting them was another consideration. The main idea with any kind of disease is to try to you know, isolate and quarantine. So if you can keep it intact in one area, that, that's the best solution. It's not uh, we don't have hospitals for salamanders and we can't recruit them all to come in and treat them all. So generally in wildlife, what we do is sort of let it run its course, but try to keep it contained into one particular area. And that can generally be done because typically, particularly with things like salamanders, right? A salamander is not moving huge distances, generally speaking. You can contain it within sort of one public land area fairly well. The bigger risk is when you have people <laughs> going and, you know, so you can imagine quite innocently, and this is what we want. We want kids to go out and, and catch salamanders and be in love with them because that's what we all <laughs> love. But if you grab a salamander from one area that's infected and then it run over to a different park and catch a second one and you could infect that one. So we really are concerned about uh, people spreading things around. Most, you know, agencies, for instance, and researchers have kind of safety protocols that they use where we bleach our equipment, we wear gloves. So we're really concerned about moving a pathogen from one location to the next. And so in the same way that that's what we would sort of encourage and that's what we have in our plans there is if we do know that an area is positive, to basically quarantine it off in any way we can and reduce or remove any traffic to that area, you know, things of that source, and then just continue testing. So if we can go out there and monitor that disease and see, generally it will spike after several weeks and then kind of trail off just as much as, as we're talking about with, you know, COVID and the curve. That's a very epidemiological thing. And so basically monitoring that uh, progression of the disease through an area is critical. We don't really have a, a vaccine or anything yet we can apply, and it's really hard to do anyway in a wildlife setting. Yeah, so generally just quarantine is our sort of current best answer. Much like COVID-19, every state is going to have its own specific response that it follows. However, the B-Cell Task Force has provided every state with the same information that it can access on the disease and suggested guidelines in dealing with this pandemic. Every state has a different set of rules. <laughs> That's what I've kind of learned in this <laughs> whole thing. And so there's certain people that have to report to other people and so on and so forth. So we've provided a template and we've provided a link to the expertise. I wouldn't say that there's one standard response that everyone is dictated to follow, more that here are the sort of best practices in terms of dealing with this. And I think for the most part, we try to design it so that pretty much everyone can follow it. But really, there's not a, you know, a tight sort of set of rules. Mostly, I think it's, and because of just the dynamics of disease and the case-by-case -case basis, I think what we try to get across to them is to reach out to us. So if you could have access, you know, to the best doctors in the world immediately, why wouldn't you do that, right? <laughs> and so in the same way, uh, if there's a B-cell, you know, outbreak in a local park in a city, just so those local officials have access to, you know, the sort of top scientists working on it, that's really what's going to be most effective in terms of dealing with uh, each case on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, just for the folks listening, can you tell us what website or what links they can go to to find that information quickly? Yeah, so our website is uh, salamanderfungus.org, and that's updated pretty regularly. That has contacts for myself and many other people involved. And, and we welcome the general public in terms of any sightings or questions that they have. We definitely want to exercise more caution than not. <laughs> So a lot of people may be wondering, what about a vaccine? One form that is being considered is probiotics and micropredators. As Dr. Kirby mentioned earlier, there is no current vaccine, and vaccinating a wild population is functionally difficult to implement. So what's the alternative? Well, it's a little complicated. For captive animals, using probiotics is one approach, but for wild ones, the challenge is greater because of competing bacteria. Yeah, so there's been a lot of sort of advancing in the understanding of microbiota and the importance they are in terms of protecting organisms from disease. We know, for instance, that there are uh, bacteria on the skin of frogs that produce chemicals that kill these chytrid fungi. And so that 
is incredibly informative and useful. And so even in my own lab, we've done some work, got a PhD student who just finished looking at some of those mechanisms and what genes are turned on and and how it works. So it's a very promising aspect in terms of, I think, the treatment and management. But again, it's kind of interesting in that we have, and even this is in our our working group, we divide these things up between captive animals and wild animals, right? So captive animals that are either in the pet trade or in zoos can be dealt with and have a veterinarian and be treated and be monitored. And so it's a lot easier to work with animals in those in those ways. You know, using probiotics can be an approach in that way. In the wild, it's, it's very difficult to do any of this. But in particular, the probiotics, I think we, we gather some information there. But in terms of being active in that, it becomes very difficult because we see studies where even if you can successfully dose, if you will, uh, animals with the proper bacteria, that has been shown to be effective in some isolated cases. But it's generally a difficult long-term solution because bacteria are fighting with each other. (laughs) And so we can sort of coat a frog or a salamander with this protective bacteria, but the native bacteria on its skin after two or three months might just outcompete it again and kind of reduce it to nothing. So there's still a lot we don't know about there, but nonetheless, it's incredibly promising. The core of all of our human medicine in terms of antibiotics is is derived from fungi and bacteria fighting each other, right? <laughs> and so that's probably where the answer lies in uh, with B-cell as well, is trying to find an effective chemical produced by bacteria that we can utilize in treatment. And again, I think that can be a modality that can be used particularly in captive situations. So if a zoo discovers a positive animal, they can treat it and treat a, proactively treat a bunch of other animals as well. In the wildlife, it's a, it's a little bit bigger of a challenge. B-cell isn't a virus, but that isn't to say they aren't working on a certain kind of vaccine for it, one that exposes the amphibian to the fungi, much in the same way that you'd expose a human to a weakened form of a virus to develop antibodies. Vaccines are, are generally aimed at viruses just by the nature of how they work. And, that, and that's mainly the idea of exposing an animal to it and it develops the proper sort of antibodies to recover from it. it. They can be generated in fungi and so that's sort of the effort. We do know from studies that if you take a frog and expose it to a chytrid fungus, and a lot of this effort is known from the, the previous chytrid fungus we, we've studied you know, for the past you know 20 years now. But basically, frogs that are exposed to that and recover from it do tend to be less uh, likely to get it again. That would be the sort of notion of trying to predispose frogs, or pre-exposed frogs, I should say, to to some sort of an active form that they can develop the antibodies. That that tends to work somewhat well, or I should say better, in viruses, just because the nature of what they are, they're just pieces of DNA that sort of take over cells. But it can be more difficult to sort of create a fungus that serves in that way. There are a lot of innate challenges with it, but definitely it is a priority in our research working group and we do have people working on it. You know, despite those challenges, I think it is an important solution. And again, particularly, I think it makes sense for captive uh, animals, right? If you have an animal, you know, a pet telemate or something like that, and you could apply some sort of treatment to it to protect it, that's easy to do. You can do it, right? In the wildlife, again, these vaccines are, are, are very difficult to implement and at best could be done with sort of agricultural animals. But wildlife in itself, just the nature of it, makes it very difficult to, to vaccinate those animals. So while a vaccine and probiotics could potentially be helpful, and there have been cases where ponds have been pre-treated and successfully protected in the past with BD, Dr. Kirby stresses that the main mode of combating this pathogen is going to be preventing it from getting here in the first place and instituting policy to keep it that way. The vaccination hasn't been done, but there was an example um, that happened where there was an infected pond and they treated the entire pond and, and protected it and got it to recover, right? And another example in California, not with B-Sal, but its sister species, uh, BD, they saw this sort of spread coming and they pre-treated these uh, frogs with one of these protected bacterias. And then that summer had a bunch of those frogs make it through. So a vaccination of sorts in that sense. It didn't work in other areas. It didn't work in other ponds. So it's not 100% quite yet. But yeah, there there are definitely kind of methods that we can use. Again, I think sort of the biggest solution that we see so far is prevention, right? <laughs> and that's that's mainly the big thing of any disease. As we see sort of with our you know current health pandemic, reducing contact and reducing spread, those are the critical ways to uh, stop disease. So that's really what we're trying to push and implement in all of our sort of wild areas is that people are sort of being smart about things. And if you're, if you're taking a boat 
to one area. We see this with other things like, you know, zebra mussels and things like that, that they're asking them to sterilize their boats and clean their boats when they go from one pond to another. So th- I think that is probably going to become more and more of a kind of normal policy going forward, just because it, it extends beyond invasive species to pathogens of all this wildlife that is the reason we're going to these sites in the first place. So, but it can be very easy, you know, just sort of simply using a, a light bleach solution or alcohol solution can be enough to kill almost all of these things. It's not really technically difficult for the general public to to take some precautionary measures to kill b cell. And I know that because this is the latest thing, b cell, but there are other diseases that are important too. So ranavirus is a, a rampant virus running through amphibian populations. You know, the other chytrid I talked about. And I'm guaranteeing you in the next 10 years, there'll be another pathogen that's that's uh, massively impacting amphibian. Uh, this is just sort of the, the evolutionary play between hosts and pathogens. And really, I think being clean and proactive about your own gear and your shoes or your boots or your well, these sorts of things will prevent future breakouts, whether they be in amphibians or birds or mammals or whatever it might be. It's quite terrifying to contemplate being responsible for making sure a pandemic that has the potential to kill many amphibian species doesn't happen. So Dr. Kirby mentions it was his greatest fear that an outbreak would occur while he was the task force chair. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But the task force remains vigilant and realistic about the risk. Yet, Dr. Kirby ended this conversation with a bit of hope by outlining the successes the task force has had with instituting policy to influence the pet trade. And it is here, he thinks, the greatest progress can be made. Yeah, so that was my greatest fear while being the chair of this task force, you know, in charge of it for <laughs> a year and being uh, involved in it now is that under my watch, uh, it would it would take off. And, and I think I would say I attribute the primary success to reducing the uh, movement of salamanders in the trade industry. So that tends to be the way we see things uh, spreading in terms of at least salamanders. So the only way it's going to get from Europe is if a European salamander comes to the United States. And so it's not doing that on its own, right? Yeah, it, it would be very hard pressed for someone even with, if you had aquatic boots on, <laughs> you went to a European pond and then wore those boots to, you know, a pond in New York or something like that. The fungi would most likely die in that time for you just to get from, <laughs> you have to jump off the plane immediately and keep them all wet. So really, I think that that effort in terms of reducing trade and trying to push for a clean trade has really been the critical aspect of that. Because what generally we think is happening, and again, this is sort of a message that even the pet trade is really getting behind, is if you have a pet animal, you know, this is sort of common understanding, well, I have this frog and I want it to be free and live a good life, so I'm going to let it go. And that, that happens a lot, you know, particularly with young kids that just become. <laughs> so so we, we adopt a lot of animals in my lab, actually, just from, from our town because, um, yeah, because that's what happens. Is so, uh, you know, you grab a bunch of cool uh, amphibians from different parts of the world and stick them all in a one tank and they get to look sad Maybe they're sick. <laughs> and then you go release them in a pond. And that is probably the most likely scenario for how these things are being introduced into these different areas. But like I say, we've actually been working um, you know, with the, the pet trade industry. They have a, a group called PJAC. That's, it's a conglomerate of all the pet trade folks. And they are uh, good people. I mean, the, these people are interested in animals like we are. <laughs> and all of us, of course, have or have had pets. We can work well with them. They have sort of a business model in some ways, but I think in in the, the core of what they're trying to do are protect these animals and promote interest in these animals. I think that's been a really great partnership with them and we're, we're continuing to work on ideas with them. Because the other thing is they have the outreach that we don't. A lot of people go to pet stores and can get that messaging pretty easily there versus, you know, no one's reading my latest scientific journal article on, on B-cell. Dr. Kirby is as modest as he is professional. And suffice it to say, I left this conversation feeling hopeful for the future of this fight against B-cell. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Kirby for taking the time to speak with Mongabe and to me about the efforts of the B-cell task force. I urge our listeners to view his information on B-Cell at salamanderfungus.org. Once again, that is salamanderfungus.org. I also encourage our listeners to listen to episodes one through three of the Manga Bay Explorers podcast to learn more about the history of B-Cell and the efforts to identify it in the wild. I'd like to extend a hearty thanks to our podcast producer, Eric Hoffner, 
and also to Rhett Butler. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks, in between episodes of our flagship podcast, the Manga Bay Newscast. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Manga Bay is a non-profit news provider, so we rely on the generosity of our listeners, readers, and friends. To add your support, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more. Keep up with all of Manga Bay's news from nature's front line at mangabay.com, or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at manga bay. Thank you once again, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Manga Bay Explorers.